I'm Morton Kondracki. Over the last four years, we've conducted 100 interviews as part of the Jack Kemp Oral History Project. Uh, what you're going to see is the last of them. Uh, it was done on March 26, 2014, with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel. Uh, I was in a studio in Washington, D.C. He was in Jerusalem. It was done by satellite. Uh, as all of you know, uh, Jack Kemp was a great friend of Israel, and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu says that over and over again. What I found fascinating about this, uh, this particular interview is the area in which um, Bibi said uh, Jack had made his most significant contribution. I hope you'll enjoy it. Yeah, okay, Prime ahead. Minister, thank you very much for doing this. I have some general questions about your relationship with Jack Kemp and then a few more specific ones. So what are your most vivid recollections about your relationship with Jack Kemp? Uh, I don't know. He was just the quintessential American for me. I mean, he was, uh, he was just uh, upstanding, stalwart, direct, honest, uh, believed in free enterprise and in fairness, uh, believed in the American-Israeli uh, relationship. Um, he, was, he was wonderful. He was a decent, uh, honorable, and brave human being. He stood his ground. He spoke his thoughts um, within the limits that we all have to uh, uh, put on ourselves in politics. He, he, he was, for me, a, a great, great friend and a great, great American. So of all the thousands and thousands of American friends that you've made over the years, I mean, how, wh where would you put him in terms of closeness? I mean, were you buddies, uh, Jack and BB and so on? Yep. Uh -huh. Yep. Uh, pretty close at the top, I'd say. Okay. Definitely. Okay. So what, what do you, uh, um, did you ever have, did you ever disagree with him about anything? Did you ever have an argument with him about anything? Uh, well, I'll tell you, we didn't have many arguments, but he tried to drill uh, in me something that I was, um, I wasn't resistant to, but I wasn't fully aware of, because we spoke about everything. Uh, we spoke about, uh, uh, about global politics. We spoke about the U.S.-Israel relations uh, relationship. We spoke about the fight against terror. We spoke about Iran. We sp in those days, that wasn't uh, on everyone's lips. Uh, we spoke about... Uh, economics. And in economics, he said to me, um, and he said this for years, well before I became prime minister for the first time, he said, you got to cut taxes. you got to cut taxes. you got to cut tax rates. And I have to admit that at the time, I was thinking of many other reforms. I was thinking of how to break monopolies and break cartels and uh, uh, get people off welfare. But he said, no, 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 you've got to cut taxes. And it took me a long time to understand the centrality of, um, of lower taxation uh, as a stimulus for growth. That's still being debated in uh, you know, certain economic circles, and, and you almost wonder, how can people debate that? It's so obvious. Why do people work? Why do they invest? Why do they take risks? They want to make money. They don't want to give it to the government. They want to make money. So if you increase their share, either the individual share or the corporate share, then you'll increase economic activity. Uh, and he said to me, I think he said, he introduced me to um, uh, the Laffer Curve. When I, when I explained that uh, as finance minister to uh, the Knesset members in the Knesset Finance Committee, they said, uh, Laufer? Uh, we don't know. Uh, who's this Laufer? I said, it's not Laufer, it's, it's Laffer. Uh, and he may even, there may be even a non jewish economist that I may refer you to, although I never checked. Uh, it was Laffer. So Jack, Jack was Laffer. Uh, and we were definitely on the right side of that curve. So uh, the influence of that actually got me, of Jack, uh, actually uh, finally zoomed in and made a difference when I became finance minister uh, and I put in tax reform and the reduction of taxes, actually the reduction of taxes pretty much across the board, uh, as uh, the primary instrument of economic growth, which uh, from there on proceeded uh, at about 5% a year for the next decade, from 2003 to the present. I, I think Jack's influence there was pivotal. Yeah. So he, he converted you to the supply side, did he? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, uh, I was pretty much of a supply sider. He made me more okay. so. 
So uh, what would you say that, aside from that, were his most significant uh, contributions to, the, to American-Israeli relations? Uh, first of all, he was a totally reliable and constant friend. He was an ally in the deepest sense of the word, and it didn't make any difference what the prevailing uh, mood was. I mean, um, whether he was in office or not in office, he was always there, the one, the one guy you can rely on, and he, uh, you know, he, he, he was loyal uh, to the administration, uh, undoubtedly, but he was also loyal to this uh, relationship. And so he would work, I think, to try to present Israel's case, even in the most uh, difficult circumstances. He, he, he never wavered. He never... Uh, he never towed a different line. He may not have said everything that he wanted to publicly, but he was very clear, I think, in private conversations, both with us and uh, with his peers about where he stood. So I think that's the first thing. He was a rock-solid ally of Israel and the American-Israel alliance. Second thing, he, he, was, he has, a, I think, a pivotal role also in the campaign to uh, release uh, Soviet Jewry. I think he was... Uh, next to uh, uh, Jackson Vanek, I mean, he was, first of all, he was one of the, the promoters of that uh, terrific, uh, terrifically important piece of legislation, but he was also uh, a constant proponent, a constant exponent of the need to uh, uh, release Soviet Jewry. And that, that made a pivotal difference in our history because the, the opening of the, of the gates of the Soviet Union and the uh, uh, the immigration into Israel of uh, over a million Jews from the former Soviet Union made a tremendous difference uh, in our future. And Jack has a, a big stake in that. Uh, I think he's, uh, these are the two, from an Israeli perspective, I would say these are the two, uh, well, three, I would say, the uh, three greatest features of his, uh, uh, of the significance of his, uh, of his lifelong friendship or the years that I knew him. One, the support of the alliance to uh, Soviet Jewry, and three, I'm telling you, lower taxation <laughs> rates, which have turned Israel into a, into a significant economic power, uh, in, in, at least in technology in the world. That wouldn't happen with high tax rates. Yeah. Um, so where did, did he ever tell you where this strong affinity for the Jewish people and Israel came from? Mm. I don't know. I think it was like, I think it was like playing football. It was just very natural for him. It didn't. It didn't require. Uh, I don't think it required a great conversion on his part. He he, he didn't come from uh, elite country clubs. Uh, you know, he came from, uh, as I understand it, from Middle America. He came from uh, Buffalo. It, it was. It's just so natural for him. Now it's it's true that this is taken root, the support for Israel, the identification with Israel, has taken root uh, and expanded uh, in, uh, in many circles in the United States, retracted in some, but overall the support for Israel is at an all-time high um, in, in the United States this year. But it was an all-time high in, in, with Jack when I met him. He didn't need polls. Uh, he didn't do it because of any, uh, uh, any expediency. It was, it was part of his Identification. You know, the first time I, I met him, which was um, uh, 1979, three years after my brother uh, fell in Antebbe, and in the institute that we founded in his name, the Jonathan Institute, um, we, I invited Jack. Uh, I was a young man at the time. He was uh, somewhat older, but a young congressman. And I invited him to uh, make a speech here in Jerusalem in a conference we did on international terrorism. It was unfashionable at the time to talk about state-sponsored terrorism. This was considered a, a big uh, deviation, uh, which of course turned out to be completely true. But it was also um, um, a moral assault on the lies of terrorists who murder babies and innocent people and pretend to be freedom fighters. And he, he spoke in his speech, I remember, about the values that we extol. He spoke ab about Israel as the, the city on the hill. I remember, actually, I remember the first time hearing that in his speech, he may have, uh, uh, you know, borrowed it obviously from elsewhere. But I remember the uh, because 
we've been here, the city on the hill, for 3,000 years. But, but the fact is, it was the first time that I heard it with such power and conviction, and it made a, an indelible impression mm -hmm. on me. So how did you... You knew he believed How did you it. come to invite him? Because you didn't know him before. I think I... No, I didn't, I didn't know him. I was going around, I was a private citizen, but I was, took upon myself to organize this conference, and I think I was about 27 years old or 28, and I started going around the United States, and I think I met, um, I think I met Norman Brayman in Miami, uh, probably seeking uh, his support, material support, and he said, you know, you really ought to get this guy, Jack Kemp. And I think I went to Washington and saw him and invited him, and, uh, and that's uh, and just the friendship took root immediately. So, so instantly. The, so the f it was so the uh, first when I met him, I knew I uh, I had a lifelong friendship yeah. with him. So the first meeting was actually in Washington, not not in Jerusalem. I don't okay. remember. Okay. I don't remember. I, uh, I can't okay. Tell you. So uh, Kemp was in Israel um, in, on June seventh, nineteen eighty one, when Israel bombed the Osirak reactor in in Iraq. Were you there too? Did you did you talk to him about that? Um, I don't think not, so. Not at okay. the time. I was I was a private citizen. Uh, uh, I woke up uh, with the news like everyone else. Oh well, it happened I think at noontime when we heard yeah. about it. Yeah. So when he, when he would visit Israel in those early days, did he see you regularly or not? I I think we may have met once or twice. I I just can't <clears throat> I can't remember. I came to Washington shortly afterwards. Uh, I, I met him first time in 1979, uh, and I think, and the next time I saw him definitely was in 1982 when I came as uh, Israel's DCM, uh, the number two in the Israeli um, embassy in Washington. And there, then I started seeing him a lot. Okay. I mean, I'd see him a lot in Congress, yeah. a lot. Did you go to football games at his house on Saturday, Sunday afternoons? No, I didn't, and I, I'm sorry I didn't. I, I, I didn't go. I, I did tell him. I think of a of a foot. The one football game that I attended uh, when I was um, in uh, Washington, or perhaps later at the UN, two days later, uh, two years later, it was a game between the Washington Redskins and I think the Dolphins. Um, and I said, "What? What am I doing?" I, I remember I told this to him. I said, "Jack, I saw this this game. I tell you, I, I never played football. I never liked football." But by the end of the game, the last five minutes, I was standing on the seat, uh, you know, waving my arms up and screaming <laughs> loud. So I told him, uh, "You're on to something." I remember we had that conversation. So did did you uh, did you go to dinners at uh, at his house? Well, we met we met Joanne and uh, uh, and Jack several times. I think we met in, and we may have been, been in restaurants. I don't remember visiting their house. I do remember visiting, seeing their families on many occasions. Um, they're just a picture perfect, yeah. and they're wonderful right. people. So um, politi in, in, is in Israeli political terms, did Jack ever say that he felt closer to Likud than to labor? Well, I refuse to say that on the grounds that it might incriminate <laughs> him. Okay. Um, so did, did, now he seemed to know a lot about Jewish history and Israeli history. Uh, how, how deeply read in it was he, do you think? He was an avid reader. I mean, he, he could, you know, you could get Jack to talk about something that he, he was passionate about, and he would, he would just get in there, and he would, he would uh, I don't think he just would rattle off facts. He did that, facts and figures, he had that, but there was a, there was a, a spine of conviction in, in everything that he talked about, and I think in everything that he did, there was, there was passion. Uh, Jack wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't uh, just, he wasn't a nerd. He wasn't a nerd because he was a great football player. Uh, but he, he had the, um, uh, he had the appetite, I think, for uh, reading and uh, uh, broad knowledge and depth. And, and this, was, this was not immediately evident. If you looked at him from afar, you wouldn't think that. But uh, as I got to know him, I saw that he would plumb the depths of a subject, and he was widely read. He was uh, very uh, proficient. He, he was a highly intelligent man and a highly, uh, highly committed, dedicated man, which I think is actually more important. Yeah. 
So I guess the biggest thing that happened while you were uh, DCM uh, was the uh, Lebanon Civil War, Israeli invasion of Lebanon and all, and all of that. And there were moments when IDF forces and U.S. Marines were actually at gunpoint. And uh, this became highly controversial in the United States. And he was obviously mm -hmm. for our staying there, even after the Marine barracks bombing. So your DCM, did you have a lot of conversation with him about what was going on? A lot, a lot. I had, uh, yes, I did. A lot. And he was, he supported our action. He understood the logic of it. I mean, you're a country attacked by terrorists. What would you do? Uh, it's what we did. Uh, and in fact, in some sense, we probably did less than what some other countries would do. But he, he understood that. I don't remember the specific uh, reaction to that near altercation. But I, I think he would uh, see it as a uh, as a momentary friction between friends. There was no question the United States uh, uh, was supporting us. There's no, no question about that. Uh, even though we had our differences, even though we had uh, arguments, but the basic American position, the em empathy was there. This is, you know, what a free state uh, and an ally of uh, the United States should do. Uh, and I think he was there. There was no question about that. Do you remember that. any other specific legislative initiatives that you were involved with him during that time? There must have been quite a few, but, but I'm, uh, I'm not getting sclerotic, but it's a <laughs> yes. long, long, I long understand. time. Ago. So, um, so uh, he, was, um, he was on the Foreign Ops Committee, obviously, ranking Republican, and so we had a lot to do with, uh, with aid to Israel, um, and I guess you must have worked with him on that. Um, well, he, he, he always said that aid to Israel was an, an investment not only in Israel's security, but, but also in American security. He believed that. It wasn't a, a shibboleth that he said. He, he really understood uh, the value of Israel as America's ally, its most reliable ally, and the strongest power in the region. Now, that, that may be understood today in a sharper perspective than it was then because of what has happened in the uh, great Arab convulsion and the implosion that we see all around us. Uh, but he, he understood that. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a political line that he was, uh, uh, you know, that he was uh, uh, spewing. It was something that he deeply believed in. There's no, n not even a shred of uh, doubt about that. He, he believed it, and in his usual way, he acted upon it to secure uh, maximum support for uh, military support for Israel. Right. So, so then in 84, you become uh, UN ambassador, uh, and you and he worked mm. on legislation, uh, anti terrorist legislation, to close down the PLO offices in New York and, uh, and, and Washington. Uh, any other specific things that you worked on together during that period? I, I just remember more that we. We kept in touch all the time. That's, I mean, he was, um, he was a buddy, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, he was, he was a close friend. It wasn't just, it wasn't just a business transaction. I mean, the business of uh, diplomacy or the business of politics. It, it, uh, it transcended that. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that um, in, uh, you know, in a kind of, uh, uh, you know, in a kind of uh, uh, hey, yeah. hey, uh, hey, hey, glorifying, yeah. Yeah. that's a hard yeah. word, but that's the one <laughs> yeah, I meant. Right. Uh, it's not a, it's, you know, it's not a glorified uh, retrospective after someone's death. It's what I felt in his life. Uh, when I talked to Jack, I knew I talked to a friend, a real friend. Right. And I, I, it, there, was, there wasn't ever a moment of uh, any doubt about that. Did, did he always regard the PLO as a, as a terrorist organization? Did he ever stop? I don't think so. I mean, he, uh, uh, that is, I don't think that he viewed them in, in other terms um, in those years, at least in the years that we spoke. The, the lines were drawn fairly clearly. I mean, their, their diplomacy is sometimes cut through them, but it was clear where the the gravity of sympathy and identification was. And for Jack, uh, it was with America and Israel and, uh, and with America's allies, uh, but first with America's allies in values. I think that's the deepest thing. He wasn't, 
he wasn't oblivious to realpolitik, but I think he was much more um, grounded in the, uh, the politics of values. I, I think that's, that's the way I would describe his thinking. So that guided everything that happened, uh, everything that I remember. Um, and those things that I don't remember in their details, but I remember the current of his thinking and the current of his, uh, uh, of his sympathy. Did, it was guided by values. Did he have any v vision of what to do about Palestinian nationalism? I don't think we talked about it that much. Um, he he uh, pretty much left it to us. I think that his view was, you know, it's your fate, it's your future, and you're the ones who should make the decision. So he wasn't, he wasn't. I don't remember him sermonizing on that or giving us uh, advice, which uh, uh, in some uh, uh, some countries would make him an exception. Mm -hmm. uh, did he? Did he? He didn't give you foreign policy advice at all, or did he? Well, he gave, he gave us advice uh, in the course of the years on specific issues that we encountered uh, or specific problems that we faced. But I don't think that he was, um, I don't remember him um, plumbing the depths of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I do remember um, uh, talking about, remember there was uh, the Soviet Union at the time, there was a question of getting the Soviet Jews out, the question of uh, uh, Star Wars. Uh, the pressures that could be placed on the Soviet Union to open the floodgates and the, po the political and uh, military support for Israel. I remember that he was, he was very clear-cut about all yeah. of this, all the time. He was one of the sponsors of, of the Levy fighter, I remember. Yeah. Um, did, That's correct. That's did correct. He, uh, did, did and, and he had, and he had a close relationship with, uh, uh, with Moshe Arons, who was uh, uh, the ambassador, my boss at the time when I came to Washington in '82. So there it was a, a, a very close relationship there as well. Did, did he ever travel in the Arab world or talk much to Arabs? Did... I don't know. I, I, I'm sure he did, but I, I don't know. Right. Uh, did he have any hope that the Arabs would ever accept Israel as a Jewish state? Or did he think that this was going to be an unending conflict? Did you ever talk about that? No, if we did, I, I probably uh, uh, said to him what I believe uh, throughout these years and believe today that the question of Israel's acceptance is a direct function of Israel's strength. If we're weak, people will think we're, we'll be disposed with. It. If we're strong, they'll make the, and, and here to stay, then they'll have to, uh, ultimately, at least some of them, uh, will make, uh, you know, make their accommodation with us. And I think, I think Jack believed that yeah. too. Um, so in 1988, uh, you go back to Israel, and he runs for president. Um, did you talk? Did right. you did you talk, did you give him any political advice, or did, did you have anything to do with his campaign? <laughs> oh, no, no. I think we spoke afterwards, uh, and uh, uh, but I no. I, I obviously followed it from afar, but uh, we were both busy at the time. Yeah. You know? Trying to get elected—that that's a pretty busy yeah. thing. Well, he he seems to have had as as much or more support among Republican Jews as any candidate. I mean, he, I guess George Bush would have had a lot because he was Reagan's vice president. But uh, you, did, you didn't help him cement those relationships. Or, no. no, no, I didn't. I I didn't. I didn't do that. But I think that people felt. See, Jack was an interesting, an interesting. Uh, 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 person because he, he was a stalwart uh, conservative, but in, in some things he was an economic conservative and a social liberal. Uh, and that came out. Uh, in fact, he, he spoke about that many times. He talked about the need for inclusion and the need for uh, you know, not, not allowing an underclass to develop. Uh, and whoever is in there, lift them up with, uh, with education, with enterprise, with uh, all sorts of projects. He spoke actually very... Um, enthusiastically about some of his ideas. I remember right. that. How to, uh, uh, how to get the inner cities to grow and uh, all sorts of other ideas that he spoke about. And, and you couldn't, I couldn't be uh, indifferent to Jack's passion. When he spoke about something, <laughs> he sort of grabbed you. Uh, and 
he didn't let you go. I mean, it wasn't that he was uh, obsessive or anything like that. He wasn't, but he, he wanted to get the force of his argument so he, you hear him out. And, you know, if you try to, uh, you give him a counter-argument, he'll give you a counter-argument for your counter-argument. Uh, and he had it, and it was reasoned. It wasn't um, thoughtless, and it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a, a, a fanatic's position. It was a reasoned, well thought out, almost empirical uh, position that became something that he that that, that was a conviction. Uh, so it was a combination of uh, reasoned faith or faith with reason. Uh, that's the way I would describe a lot of his. Uh, um, a lot of his positions. In fact, anything that he truly believed in, I think, is, could be summed up that So way. one of the most interesting periods is he's HUD secretary, right? But he's a HUD uh, Housing and Urban Development Secretary, but he's a Housing and Urban Deve Development Secretary with a foreign policy. Um, and he got into a lot of uh, conflicts with James Baker, the Secretary of State, and with, uh, oh. with George Bush. He was almost constantly in trouble uh, uh, with the administration. So... Um, did, did he talk to you about what he thought Baker and Bush's attitudes toward Israel were? Not, not directly, but you could understand by making his, the way he made his case, uh, what he believed should be the, the case. He, he, didn't, he didn't go out publicly, I think. I think the only time, I think he met Sharon when he was persona non grata in uh, Washington, I remember that. Uh, and he may, I'm, he may have done it with the consent of... Uh, of the administration. I don't know that. No, but he did not. And if he did, it's, <laughs> he did not. He did not. Okay. <laughs> that, that would be, that would be typical of, uh, of uh, uh, Jack. He was, you know, he was undaunting, but uh, he believed in something. He yeah. did it. So within limits, but he did. So it. you were a delegate at uh, at the Madrid conference. Did did he have a particular attitude about the Madrid and Oslo processes? Um, I don't remember. I, I think he had a healthy skepticism, but I think he left the, uh, you know, but he said, look, if you guys can work it out and you can finish this conflict, by all means. But I don't remember specific uh, references to it. Okay, so the most famous altercation that, it, that occurred during the, uh, during the Bush years was when uh, uh, Jack told Ed Koch, the former mayor of New York, that he'd come from a meeting with James Baker and the upshot of the conversation was a headline in the New York Post, Baker, colon, F the Jews. You, you remember that? Uh, did he? Who, who can forget did it? He, did he, he talked to a lot of people about that conversation. Did he talk to you? No, I don't think so, but I read it in the paper. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so among his, uh, among his Israeli friends, uh, you were obviously one of the closest. Who, who else was he close to? I, I know for a fact that he was very close to uh, Moshe Arons, uh at the time, and I'm sure he was friendly with others. But there was uh, um, an easy familiarity that... Uh, Jack had uh, with both Misha and myself because I think we knew American culture. We, I didn't know American football, I have to admit, but in all other aspects we, we could converse uh, um, about, um, uh, about common themes. Uh, so, I, you know, I can tell you about Moshe Aarons, but I, I, I'm not sure what the rest of the list includes. Obviously, Ariel Sharon, he, he met him. Yeah. So... Um what, what would you say that uh, <clears throat> Jack Kemp, how, how did Jack Kemp and his ideas influence your prime ministership? Number uh, three things immediately, taxes, 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 <laughs> which means lower them. Uh, my, my, it, it's not so much my prime ministership, but in, in the aftermath when I reviewed what I did uh, in economics, uh, I, I did something, I talk, actually I talked to him a, a great deal about something that I, I did as prime minister, and that was to open the uh, the foreign currency controls. You, you got to understand, Israel was um, was like a third world country, uh, which don't exist anymore. Uh, in 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 1996, I mean, it had closed uh, currency markets. You couldn't take out 
a couple of thousand dollars without uh, an approval, more than a couple of thousand dollars without an approval from a clerk in the Bank of Israel, the central bank. And if you didn't deposit it, uh, you, you, uh, you, know, you transgressed. So I came to the unusual idea of uh, opening up the currency markets and relieving the controls. And there was a great debate. All previous prime ministers uh, who had considered that were told that a mountain of money would run out of the country. Uh, and I, I thought, maybe they won't, maybe they won't. In any case, I did it, and a mountain of money did move inside. inside. Not outside, uh, and uh, and that was a great uh, uh, reform that I remember. I, I did discuss this with Jack, and he was he was very happy yeah. about it. I mean, he he felt he he felt vindicated. That was his direction. But he said, then he said to me, I remember this conversation. He said to me, yeah, but what are you doing about taxes? <laughs> and you know, and he was right. Yeah. He was absolutely right. So when I when I reviewed my first term and. I made some other reforms, but I said, you know, you got another chance. You've got to do what Jack said. And that's exactly what I did. I mean, we did many other reforms, but I put lowering taxes uh, right up in my agenda. Uh, so when I came, uh, and, and that I got to do uh, as, far, as finance minister in 2003, we were in a great crisis. Uh, and I, I had about... I don't know, 10 days to work out a, a plan, which I did. Um, and then I wanted to, and a central pivot of it was the, um, shall we say, the Jack Kemp uh, plank, lowering tax rates. Well, I came to present that and got an immediate, uh, you know, hit from uh, the uh, bureaucracy. And they said, um, they said, you can't do that. Um, I said, why not? He said, it's illegal. I said, what? It's illegal? Yeah, it's not, uh, uh, it's not equal and not fair because half the people are not paying taxes. I said, well, you'd think that would actually make you want to lower the tax rates for the others who do. Uh, and anyway, they said, but we won't be able to defend you uh, in court against uh, uh, challenges that we'd have. I said, okay, don't defend me. I'll defend myself. I'll bring in uh, Nobel Prize winners. Uh, and I think I called Jack at the time uh, because I wanted to get a list of uh, all the economists who I could bring. I was seriously prepared to go to the Israeli courts to argue the case for lower taxes. So he must have gotten to me. I, I had become Kempized by then. <laughs> so uh, final question. So he is. I didn't need to, by the way. They, we finally did it without going to court. So uh, he famously called you the, uh, the Israeli Ronald Reagan, and I think he may have even called you the Israeli Winston Churchill. So what would you call Jack Kemp in terms of historical, uh, his place in history? A great American, great American who uh, carried the torch for the time that he held it. He carried the torch. He never fumbled. Never let it fall. He, he knew the value of freedom. He was a great American patriot and a great champion of freedom. Um, um, and a wonderful friend of Israel and of, of, of me personally. I, I always will think of him in those terms. Prime Minister, thank you very much for taking your time. Thank you.